with this team. He's never worn them out before. 20 years he's been playing this fucking character. And now, toughen up, get ready. Yeah. Fuck yeah. And cut. Cut. He looks scared. Fix him. Okay. <laughs> Cut, guys. Guys, it's awesome. Great job, team. Looks really good. Really good. Okay. Yeah. I like how Sean operates on a set. He, he's, he and I are the same. And that, like, I don't care whose idea it is. Let's make this the best thing we could possibly do. The movie has a lot of action. It has a lot of violence. How do you give the audience a full meal without it feeling like you're bludgeoning them with more of the same? For one thing, you don't do it digitally, you do it real. Then you find a different idea for each action scene. What's an idea that's going to distinguish it? How can we approach this one fight where finally Deadpool and Wolverine are not trying to kill each other. They're fighting together. Come on. How can we tell that story in a way that is emotionally satisfying, but also visually and conceptually different than everything that came before it? And that led to what we now call the one -er. This is one shot showing the human body doing stuff for real in real space in uninterrupted time. Uh, from the outside? Yeah, from George. The one who finished George. Yeah, boom. Yeah. Wolverine coming in. The one -er, as we call it, is something that's been discussed from very, very early on. And when we first talked about it, Ryan said to me, I have been dreaming about this shot for, I think he said, seven or nine years. I saw the storyboards, and the storyboards were incredible. The difficulty of putting all of those pieces of the pies together are so massive that it never really happens. This was something we worked on for a year, figuring out how the hell do we do that? And this was literally over 100 people coming together to figure out this very basic idea and how do we deliver on the promise of that idea and hopefully we pulled it off. It's all done in what we call a motion control shot. It's all one continuous action. I'm here operating the Milo motion control rig. Basically, it's a machine that holds a camera and it's accurate down to microns. And the reason for this is so that we can get the camera move in and it's exactly the same at time and time again. And we can repeat those passes. The one broke down in our minds in four sections. We only had a three hour window a day where the light would be in the correct position to make it work. And we would just get section one one day. And then once we'd got that section, we'd spend the rest of the day rehearsing for the next day. And then it just went on like that. Yes! <laughs> yes. We got it, we got yeah. it. It feels so iconic, this idea of these two characters in this one shot that goes along. But the reality of it was it's three minutes long. And I remember finishing two or three takes so out of breath. That's never happened to me before. Um, so, yeah, we, we sweated. Holy shit. You save the good stuff for special occasions? Killing mostly. Who would ever have thought in this version, in this conversation of music, that Madonna, like a prayer, would be in one of the biggest wonder action sequences in Deadpool history? But that's that's what Deadpool is so good at. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. The, it, it's like the fourth wall breaks and the music they set up in the original totally unearthed its own tone. Ryan had had this idea of like a prayer in his mind for, I think, like six years. 
And so we always knew from the earliest meetings that this one earth, it was gonna be like a prayer by Madonna, and now it is. Show us your natural speed. Yeah. That was one of my favorite, that's one of my favorite moments in the movie because it's just a great plant payoff and it pays off even more if you watch the movie a second time. One guy starts and then a couple more join and then another one and I think it was so much pre-planning and choreography and timing, and it's been a, a long journey, but it was a very grounded kind of love letter to Deadpool. Finding that balance, I think Sean has done brilliantly. Working with so many different stunt performers, doing choreography, having the camera there, and trying to do a shot that I'd never done before. And it was, it was a challenge that I loved. And, Ryan and Sean, who conceived of that idea, it was just genius. When fans see that scene, I know there's gonna be one they're gonna rewind over and over and over again. Are you ready? I get to kill a hundred yous? Fuck you, yeah, I'm ready. The whole challenge of telling a Deadpool story in the MCU is that Deadpool is very grounded, raw, but there was something about this combination of Wolverine and Deadpool that gave it anthemic stakes and scale, but still felt rooted in the real world. And in fact, we went to great lengths to shoot this movie not on green screen, but largely on locations. It's why the paparazzi got pictures. It's why the spoilers hit the internet while we were shooting. But I actually can handle those spoilers because it meant we went into the world to shoot things for real. Not only did we have an incredible script, not only are we making a movie with Deadpool and Wolverine, but everybody who came to the set every day really poured their heart and soul into it. Ray Chan is our production designer who came in and just kind of invented things that were just second to none. We had a list of things to avoid. Anything too slick, anything too glossy, anything sci-fi looking, anything overtly CGI dependent. So that then, a lot of the conceptual designs and the environments had to be grounded and a sense of realism. We are here in the TVA command center, kind of mission control for the TVA. And here's a little known tidbit that I learned today, which is that in his design and execution of this incredible set, our production designer, Ray, Ray Chan, ended up buying every bit of copper leaf. Copper leaf? All of it? Not just in the United Kingdom, but in Europe. So notice how all these little details are painted with copper leaf. That's on every cubicle, that's on the elevator, that's on the edging. Um, so to all of the Europeans complaining that they can't get their hands on copper leaf in the summer of 2023, it's our fault. Definitely it's Deadpool's fault. When we first embarked on our journey, Sean said, check out Loki season one. And there's a section where the TVA featured heavily and not be a slave to Loki, but appreciate and acknowledge what the guys had already set up as an aesthetic. Our TVA is a separate division to the TVA that was already established. So I had a little bit of leeway. In fact, I had plenty of leeway because it was a separate division. So that's a challenge. Does it clutter the lines of it? It doesn't. Uh, Ray, do you have a strong feeling? Well, apparently. Lose the chair or keep oh, it. I like the chair. You like the chair. Yeah. I, mean, it gives, it gives it I need to do it justice. Then I need to then give it my own mark. Ray created a world unlike anything I've ever seen. Ah, it's perfect. <laughs> Ray's just design of the TVA and how he took like the original inspiration from Loki and just, you know, I think made it uh, this, the most full-throated version that it could ever possibly be. If you open a desk in the TVA, there's going to be things in the drawer that are relevant to the TVA. It was unbelievable. I think we didn't have an initial script. We had an outline, almost like a cheat sheet, the uh, first act, second act, third act, and just things to sort of 
start mulling over environments, characters, big sequences, important sequences. So that, that's, that's where my journey begins and I start to formulate seeing um, exhibitions in art galleries and seeing sculptures and surrealist paintings and just absorbing lots of things, creating lots of folders in my sort of database. That's how I start. So you lean on your content, you lean on your production design to help you picture the movie. And so Ray did this shot like six months ago. I lean to Sean for the storytelling side of things. And he's a brilliant storyteller, an incredible storyteller and director. From my perspective, we knew Deadpool 1 and 2 was huge successes. I had to appreciate what those guys did on Deadpool 1 and 2 to then sort of put myself in their mind frame for Deadpool 3. And I think our movie was more at stake and a lot more emotions. There was many, many scenes that are more poignant scenes that I try and reflect in the sort of production design. Working with creative teammates, you get each other's rhythms. Over time, you understand each other innately. Special opener, then from that same angle, over. As Ryan and I came up with ideas for sequences or environments, we would throw them to Ray. Ray's mantra was, leave it with me, boss. That's good. I'm gonna put some uh, stickers yeah. on me. We leave it. Welcome to the void. Um, the normal way to do a sequence in a barren wasteland filled with Easter eggs would be to build a small set and do it on a soundstage. But from the outset, we wanted Deadpool to feel grounded so that when you're watching the movie, you feel that texture of reality. The way the wind is hitting our actors, the way the sun is in and out, the way the clouds are shifting. We populated the set with space debris and other debris from the Marvel Universe. But it was always scripted to have a large 20th century fox sign. And we're talking large. <laughs> Rest in pieces, Fox. It was a piece which I really enjoyed making because in my head, the 20th century fox could be carved out by 20 stone masons. I think it was about 22 feet, 24 feet to the very top and about 45 feet wide. So it was a big, heavy, cumbersome piece, as you can imagine. So this is fun. We are in Ant-Man Arena, as we affectionately call Cassandra Nova's hideout. Obviously, I, I start with Giant Ant-Man. I studied, we scanned from the costume department, we scanned the costume, and then we magnified the armor. So we replicated his costume exponentially. Our physical set piece was about 140 feet across from inner arm to inner arm, and about 25, 30 feet high. It's mind blowing. Being in that environment is just, you immediately feel like you're actually there. Because, yeah, especially when there's so much practical functioning parts of the set, you can't not feel it, you know? They've got, like, sparks flying and smoke and all these vehicles that actually rev up and move. And also that sort of child part of you who essentially just wants to play and have a playground <laughs> is sort of loving it. Because it's a real chance to just lose yourself in it. My hat's off to I, you, sir. What? Truly. This, I didn't, he's, that, I don't... <laughs> Welcome to Wade Wilson's neighborhood. I'm kind of astonished by the level of authenticity and the details that I could point out to you that take essentially an artificially created city street and make it look authentic. For instance, putting in metal plates into the street. There's no reason for that, other than the fact that those details, the filth kind of that accumulates on the curb. Starting from scratch on the back lot said is a, a designer's dream. The biggest compliment was for Sean. Bro, he goes, 
bro, and bro. Uh, this is amazing, just in the finishings and the details, and that's the biggest compliment from someone who actually lives in New York to say that. That's my happiest moment. Because this film's so varied, I have my own sort of attachment to each set, be it the Canadian CD bar, way to apartment, the diner, the void. That's what I'm talking about, something like this. Getting the opportunity as a designer, it's just been an enjoyable ride. And that, to me, I think my dreams have come true. Everyone here is on the run from Goliath. Most don't make it. There's a resistance, though. Other people like us that managed to survive. We had legacy heroes that show up in the void, which was really, really fun for us. We set up a war room at Marvel in the office, and we made flashcards with pictures and characters from every single one of the Fox movies, the Sony movies, and we were just going through the history of all the films, trying to figure out who would be perfect for this. There are surprise appearances in this movie where when we pitch them early on, we're like, yeah, well, that would be amazing to get that person, but I mean, it's never gonna happen. And then every one of them happened. And you know how? We asked. It was the damnedest thing. People love them some Deadpool. So, 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 like, ready. Like, ready. Oh, like, good, ready, right? ready, ready to go. And we got a murderer's row of characters that made so many shoot days more than fun, it made them pinch me level surreal. You don't know what it's like to see. There's a whole universe out there of characters that never really got their ending. That's kind of how we chose the legacy heroes in the void. I hope you're not expecting too much screen time. I'm thinking Pratt and Love and Thunder in a second more. Chris and I sort of have a history of trading cameos in movies. You're not gonna love what happens next. Oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. He's gonna say it. He's gonna say it, he's gonna say, say it. Say what? Avengers. Blame on! Oh, I'm sorry, what? I wrote this set up for him where Deadpool sort of talks about him as, a, as the ultimate trash talker, that it's not me. Like you said in the convoy, this finger licking, dead inside pixie slab of third rate dime store nut milk can eat your delicious cinnamon ring and kick rocks all the way to bald hell. Okay, I have never said any of those words in my entire ah, life. The modesty. And I wrote this tag for Chris. Initially, I just wrote it to trick and manipulate Chris into saying yes. It's like, but there's also this scene that, and then um, it became something that was like really funny, actually. And I was like, actually, this has to be in the movie. And Chris only agreed to do the movie as long as that tag stays in the movie, which I don't blame him at all. I won't be happy until I've urinated on her freshly barbecued corpse and husk fuck the charred remains while gargling juggernauts juggernauts. Wow. And you can quote me. Okay. Stepping back into Electra has been a total trip. I played Electra 21 years ago. So I had not picked up a sigh other than like to show off for my kids' friends. <laughs> like I used to tell my kids' friends, I'm a ninja and I would pull them out and they'd be like, Ugh. But I hadn't done anything like that in years and years and years. It's so fun. <laughs> Wesley is Blade to me and ushered in a whole era and, and took risks back then that hadn't really been done. This is a character that Wesley, in large part, created. This version of my blade, I thought I'd make him a little more comfortable with himself. You know, in the first ones, he was a little more angry and he had chips on his shoulders and he had a lot of issues. Figured time has passed, he's had plenty of therapy. So now he, he's issueless. I was born ready. Smiling and having a great time being who he is. There's only ever been one blade. There's only ever gonna be one blade. It's great. They call me the Gambit. Good. Hey, you sure you didn't just really, really want them to, but it never quite worked out? I've been dancing around Gambit for almost close to like 20 years now. I'd have done truly anything to actually walk onto screen as Gambit just even one time. You want me to look intense or you want me to look like really chill? Like that? I, you tell me, man. I am I'll trusting your instincts. Even my childhood, I was playing Gambit. My dad's from New Orleans. And I was the kid that was grabbing like my dad's duster and my dad's raincoat. I had a pack of cards and I was always chucking them at my friends and like doing the whole thing. Talk or I'm gonna start dealing. 
I just felt like we just played the like the highest stakes, like make believe game that you could possibly play. I, I didn't want to stop yesterday. Everybody was like tired. I was like, do we have to go home? <laughs> do I have to take it off? <laughs> With Laura, because I played her at such a young age, she's sort of embedded in me in a way. And she's been waiting to come out again. Don't make me regret it. Finding this new, like more mature, older Laura was very interesting because she's still like intrinsically nature-wise, she's still that like wild, feral character, but also at the same time she's she's now grown and she's got more management of her emotions in a way. And she's also, to me, it seems like Logan softened her. It was good to see you again. Logan. This film felt like a real team effort. I think we were all just very, very happy to be there. That's what I'm talking about! Big slow-motion fight! You guys all working together, sad music, who knows if you lived or died, that sort of thing. Who's ready? We should just go film it if you're Let's comfortable with that. Yeah. They all kind of took the initiative to do everything they could to prepare for this, but also they knew they really wanted to deliver for the fans who have lived with these characters for 20 years. They all came a week early just to like rehearse and do the practice, the fight sequence over and over and over again, which I thought was a real testament to their work ethic and dedication. People underestimate what it takes to be an action actor and how athletic you have to be, how in condition you have to be. You know, they take it kind of for granted you know, until they come on set and try to do it themselves. And then they see what's up. Don't you go here, they, the last two are quick. <laughs> I box a lot when I'm getting ready to do any kind of action. It's great for your arms, it just is incredible. Just, it helps your whole body move when you're fighting. And then more strength, more cardio, more running, just to be ready for whatever they threw at me. Yeah. I still work out on a regular basis at home, so I still kind of keep myself in, I guess you can say, blade condition. But, you know, it's still challenging. It's like a fighter who hasn't been in the ring for a, a while. You still have the skill sets, but you're rusty, your timing might be just a little off, and God knows the next day after you film and you fight, you are sore, sore, sore. I've done martial arts since I was like nine. I've tricked and flipped and stuff all my life and like break dance. So it's all like a part of movement and some of it I've played around with since I've been a kid, you know, doing backflips off chain link fences and things and on dares. And so I feel like I've been training for this stuff my whole life just for fun. Everything looks good. Yes. Doing the stunt training really helped me find her again in a way, because she's such a physical character that you have to find her from there that like iconic stance had to feel cleaner that sort of like precision of like and here she is they just did such an incredible job with the costumes this is a different costume a lot less skin Electra always had a lot more midriff showing which we wouldn't need that now. That's not necessary. Electra's had three kids, but I feel great. I'm happy in it. I can move and it still looks like Electra, which I love. And the big difference is I'm not wearing heels. <laughs> I said, I just don't know if my 51 year old feet can fight in high heels all day. I don't know if I could do it. So I'm in a bit of a wedge. This costume is a little different from the one we had before. It's less shiny. Yeah, it's less sparkly. You know? I don't have the same drip that I had in the other ones. Putting it on, you know, you start to see where your body's changed, where you need to still improve or, you know, build up. And thank God for muscle suits. <laughs> you just stay on our six and get inside. We'll make sure you get the package. And we'll get our ending. I put on the costume and I was like, oh, this is sick. She feels so different. And I put the glasses on, I was like, she feels the exact same and the backpack, and it was, it was very surreal. It's like we were back on set for Logan, and no time had passed, and we were just doing it again. For Gambit, we just basically decided, like, all right, we're just gonna do exactly what he looks like in the comics. Like, I mean, pick the picture, and the magicians that work on this movie just figured it out, down to, like, the pattern on the on the chest plate to like the headgear. Bill Corso, man. Yeah. Like, we all just had to go. Hey, Bill, how do you do it? He's like, just use it as prosthetics. You just move it down. It's extraordinary what they pulled together. I, I still can't believe it. Oh, how long I waited for this. Oh, I'm about to make a name for myself. 
Sean and Ryan have dreamed of this moment of all of us coming together to fight for them and help them accomplish their goals. And to watch Sean and Ryan get so excited about their dream becoming a reality in front of their eyes is really awesome. It's so good. Some of my favorite moments in the movie are standing shoulder to shoulder with those guys. It's fun, it's gruesome, it's a blast. We got the biggest playground there is, which is we're in the MCU, baby. It was everything we dreamed of. It was more than everything we dreamed of. It was literally 50 times better than I ever dreamed of. Well done, well done. Ryan and Sean have truly given me a gift that I probably will never be able to pay them back for. Love you guys, thank you for this. All right, Jenny, Jenny, Jenny. 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 I started pitching movies to Kevin Feige and Marvel right after Disney bought Fox. Ironically, I pitched him a Deadpool Wolverine movie, but Wolverine was kind of a non-starter because of Logan. Your anchor being died in an act of self-sacrifice so epic that it sent shivers down the timeline. I had always been very vocal with Hugh that he had one of the best endings of any fictional character ever. And I told him that is so amazing what he was able to accomplish in Logan. That's what we were striving for with Robert Downey Jr. in Endgame, is to give this incredible, iconic, fictional character an amazing ending. Oh, so this is what it feels like. I really thought when we finished Logan, I'm really proud of the film, I'm proud of what we created, and I meant what I said when I was done. And then 2022, I was driving to the beach, and like a bolt of lightning came, I want to do Wolverine Deadpool. Sorry, Ryan, that's how I see the title, by the way. I know you, Bub. Nope. I know you. Everybody knows me. I'm the Wolverine. The inclusion of Wolverine in this Deadpool movie suddenly gave it its lifeblood, suddenly gave it its undeniable reason to exist. This slogan has the same, he can do anything, even musicals look. And bonus, he's actually wearing a costume like he's not embarrassed to be in a superhero movie for once. The stress I had as one of the writers of the movie was finding the access point into Wolverine that does two things that one, allows audiences to connect with a character that they've known for more than two decades, but also does something different with the character that hasn't yet been done. I am wearing this suit and that means a lot of things, but most of all, it means I'm an X-Man. Hugh Jackman as Wolverine you could make a strong case that the entire superhero movie industry is built on that performance because that performance in X-Men showed everyone if you take these characters seriously and get them on the screen as they're loved and written in the comic book world, it works. Trust me, kid, I'm no hero. Well, that suit sounds different. I don't think I fully understood what it meant to the wider world. I was not a... A uh, comic book fan in particular growing up. I, I had never heard of X-Men. And in some ways, I'm really glad I didn't know because I really approached Logan as I would any other character. Yes, he had claws coming in. Yes, he could heal himself and he had kind of crazy hair. But for me, it was just another character to embody and all the humanness of him. Say, how do you friends for me? He brings such a gravitas to this character. It's so real, it's so emotional. I remember talking to him about some of the, the story paths we were going down and he was just so excited because he felt like he was scratching an itch with this character that he always wanted to scratch. You might not know it, but you're a good man, Logan. <laughs> you might not know it, but apparently I'm the worst, Logan. In the first script that we wrote, Hugh sent us a 10-minute voice memo, which I don't recommend sending a 10-minute voice memo to anyone, but the idea that he was the worst Wolverine is the thing that came of Hugh's voice memo. It was such a great access point for us, because you not only have the worst Wolverine, but you have a Wolverine that is finally, after 24 years, wearing the yellow suit, you know, wandering around set like Admiral Banana. When I got in the yellow and blue, I knew immediately it would work. It felt amazing. I felt more grounded, deeper, connected than I ever had before in the 24 years. Holy shit! You saved the good stuff for special occasions? Killing mostly. I was astonished at how we never tried it, never looked at it. But when I see it, and when I see it, particularly with that cow, I feel more than ever before, me, Hugh Jackman, is lost, gone. 
It's just Wolverine. What's with the suit? First thing I did when I flamed out, I took mine off. Drop it. It's not that ugly. Stop talking about did my suit. you make it suit. yourself? Been there. Oh my god. The legends are true. In the script, we find a few Wolverine variants. It wasn't until we showed Sean, like, oh, here's what we're thinking. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, let's get the John Byrne brown and tan costume. Yeah. Let's get Wolverine on the cross. Let's get Calvarine. Let's get, like, Old Man Logan. Old we, Man we, Logan. We hit, we hit some, like, real deep cut comic fans to start digging right. out these Logan variants. It's not you. We're just going in a different direction. That's a recipe for humor. Oh my God, your hair. Oh. It's certainly a recipe for conflict, which is also funny. No Makeup Monday. Good for you. In the case of our movie, it's a recipe for violence. John Burn Brown and Tan. Now, you fought the Hulk in this outfit, no? I'm Marvel Jesus, you dull creature, and I want to... Yeah. I've always said crazy. if he doesn't want to put the claws back on again, I will. <laughs> you really want? Because he's an actor that is like a Swiss Army knife and can kind of do anything at any moment and, and pivot in strange and wonderful ways. He kind of gave the license for Sean and I to really explore a slightly different version of Wolverine. Wow, you really are the worst one. I have never been so happy to wake up in the morning and go to a set in my life. I've never laughed so much. <laughs> so good, Wolverine! Yeah, Wesley. And when you're playing Wolverine, it's really great to be able to laugh in between takes. And when you're with Ryan and Sean, we did, but there was a freedom. I like this guy. <laughs> we supported each other. We played with, you know, it, it felt new and fresh, and it was the most fun I've ever had playing the part. <laughs> oh, we're just getting started. Look, Daddy Deadpool wants to get paid, so it, let's do this. Here we go. Let's, uh, let's get away for this one. Mm, nothing like a smell of fresh plastic, am I right? Well, looky here. The sculptor did a really bang up job there. The song's actually called 97 Red Balloons because the other two are right here. Here we go. You may recognize this little beauty from the 1997 X Men series. Coincidentally, 97 is in fact Hugh Jackman's age. Missing a little camel toe, but no notes. Okay, and then, ooh, this is a bit of a spoiler here. Yeah, Kelly, you want to blur this out? Oh, you're, oh, you already did. Okay, good. Smooth gliding action. Ramrod steel at the front. Oh, gorgeous. So much detail, so... Oh, you can smell it. it's barely used. Mm, so lifelike, wow. Oh, if you could see what I'm seeing right now, you'd be picking up your phone to snatch one of these bad boys out before they sell out. Oh, yeah. That's gotta be four or five horsepower. Give me five, guys. Hello everyone, Dr. Deadpool here with an important message about male genitalia. Now I know what you're thinking, here comes another preachy message about our rucksacks, but not today. No, no, today we're talking about Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. And Disney has graciously offered the star of one of its biggest summer movies to demonstrate a routine self-examination. Bring it in. Do I have to do this? What, are you afraid your little showman will shrink in the spotlight? No worries. I'm here. Whoa. I gotcha. Whoa, no, 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 no. Fuck it, we'll just do over the pants hand stuff. Oh, wow, okay. Listen, everybody, check yourself. Testicular cancer is very treatable, and I'm out of here. Hugh, you okay? No, it's disgusting. Huey, come on! <laughs> okay. Testicular cancer is the leading cancer in men ages 15 to 35, but it's one of the most treatable cancers if caught early. Where does cowardice like that come from? Hey there, Disney. Ryan Reynolds here with one of my best friends, Hugh Jackman. Hey, everyone. I'm so excited to be here promoting a movie that I poured my blood, sweat, and tears into. My character's name is Wade. And you all probably know my character's name. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Back up. You were in the 1998 Disney original movie Tourist Trap? What? No. Then why did you just imply you were in it? Oh, hold on. Sorry. What movie were you here to promote? My star turn as Wade Early in a Disney original masterpiece, Tourist Trap. What oh, movie wow. did you think we're here oh, to promote? God. I'm out. I'm out. Mike, a spicy. Wow. You forgot to do the little wand thing, Hugh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the little thing. Hey, can I wait? Yeah. Am I that? Oh, 
I see what you've done there. So tune in to Tourist Trap on Disney Plus, or you know maybe search it on on YouTube. It had Oscar bridesmaid Paul Giamatti. I know another Oscar bridesmaid. Come on, guys. Oh, this guy. We're looking for a group of survivors. Oh, they're out there. <laughs> yeah, but Merc to Merc. Yeah, they're crazy. They will chop you up into a thousand pieces and hide you all over the void. I'd be fighting alongside them, but my calling is to one day host a podcast that monetizes the women's movement. Hey, cowboy, my eyes are up here. I know it's tempting. I look at it too sometimes. Go ahead. Treat yourself. Do you like what you see? My eyes are over here. Easy does it. Slide right into that DM. Drink it in. We'll just swallow a bunch of pills and just lose ourselves in tangled sheets and bodies. That's right, we'll ignore each other for four or five days at work and then we'll go right back at it. You can feel your underwear getting tighter, can't you? It was raised on Danielle Steele. That guy knows what I'm talking about. I'd tell him to stop eye-fucking me, but his eyes fuck like brain-damaged great white sharks. His eyes fuck like stallions. His eyes fuck like a mid-80s Jean-Claude Van Damme. Like El Tigre. Like a rabid Kodiak bear. Like thirsty, angry pandas. Like hungry dragons. I'd tell him to stop eye-fucking me, but my mouth's about to be very busy. <laughs> I think I'm hit. Did they get my face? Oh, oh shit. No, no, I'm just okay. keep going. I'm strong with that. I was an I'm anal bird. Fuck. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, look at this little guy. You have a Shirley Temple? It's a little cabbage patch kid. <laughs> he was laying them buttery notes all up in my mama, and I shot up there, and I said, what's up, doc? <laughs> Fetch the car. I want to hit Shake Shack. Diarrhea comforts me. Okay. All right. This is my friend Peter. Show him Sugar Bear. Oh. You like that? Nice, right? We doing this? Let's go. In the immortal words of Anthony Alejandro Stark. Anthony Penelope Stark. Anthony Soprano Stark. Anthony Ingrid Shart. Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Edwards from ER. <laughs> I want you to come at me hot, and I want you to come at me angry. But mostly, I just want you to come. Piggyback ambush. Fuck off. I got my first real six string. Oh, Get fucked. Oh. Cassandra Nova, a megalomaniacal fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Husk fucked her charred remains while gargling juggernauts, 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 juggernauts. Wow. And you can quote me. Okay. <laughs> Blade won't admit it, but he wants a s'more. You know, once you get past the anger, he's he's really quite angry. Fuck off. Fucking off. I don't listen to you anyway, Bob. I don't listen to a fucking word you've said. <laughs> You're a great leader. It's all bullshit. Honestly, we stay together for the kids. Guilty! On all charges! <laughs> oh, fuck off! Oh, fuck off! Fuck off! Fuck off! Oh, fuck off! You can't even say Michael Eisner. <laughs> Come on, he was a guy of the 80s. Yes. I'm gonna let him live! Wait, wait, no! Minute! No, you're gonna go, oh, you're gonna yeah. go, yeah. like you mean it! Okay, ready. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live! Like you! Man, I'm gonna live! Yeah, it goes down around the corner and back down through the hall and tunnel. Oh, motherfucker! Oh my god, motherfucker! Oh, that's good, motherfucker! Right? That's like a football from 1912. Full blown gonorrhea had a baby with a chihuahua. Her tongue is your new bath. Her asshole has teeth. All right. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I don't need to move my <laughs> finger. There we go. Wow. This is cool. She has a hungry asshole. Ooh. We'll cut that out. That's dessert. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> Dear God, please fucking kill me now. I hate my life and BS. You're a cock chugging fuck stain for approving that Disney Fox deal. <laughs> I run out of air. I run out of.